Hello there and welcome. This is Hugh here letting you know that episode 8 of the Friendly Podcast is about to start, an online multimedia project made possible by the support of Ireland Yearly Meeting. During this series, I'm sharing a range of interviews with folks from both home and abroad to explore what makes us friends today. First up this time, we say hello to David Chapman, who attends Waterford Meeting in the sunny southeast. When I came to Waterford, my my wife is a Catholic, um, and um, I had been acquainted with, I had been to a Roman Catholic school in England, um, and I had always been involved in um, the Anglican Church, uh, right since I was about sort of uh, 14 through youth clubs, and uh, I went to a kind of a Church of England uh, uh, teacher training college. Being part, I think, of a, a worshipping community was quite important to me. But with working abroad and doing a fair bit of reading and um, moving amongst a lot of um, different, uh, I suppose, religious uh, um, settings, um, I and, and coming to Ireland, particularly in the early 80s, where um, religion was quite important, you know, in, in, in the local community and everything else. And um, you, were, you tended to be identified by it. And um, I, I basically didn't really want to um, be part of a religious tradition that had a lot of baggage. Um, and I found that the Church of Ireland, um, which had the closest links with the Anglican Church, um, and to some extent the Roman Catholic um, church as well as a Lua. I had lots of um, good experiences with both and um, I had become rather impressed with the whole idea of um, uh, silence and um, I suppose the idea of a God beyond traditions, beyond language, those kinds of things. I came along um, one Sunday to Waterford meeting and um, found I, I, I rather like the format and um, basically have stayed ever since. And, and, and I, I think it, it's partly, you know, where the Quakers are in, in, in Ireland, which is kind of negotiating the whole problems that arise from different forms of religious organizations and uh, commitment requirements and all those kinds of things, rituals and what have you. Um, I just found the, the kind of the simplification very attractive and um, um, helpful. It did sort of cut through a lot of things in my own mind. And um, I, I, I found it, 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 it fruitful for me to to be a fairly committed um, attender and to be part of that process on, on a weekly ba- basis. So are you, um, are, you, are you conscious of a difference between somebody who finds Quakerism later in life to those who are born into it and possibly don't know any difference? I, th- I think so. I think it's the same with any tradition, really. Yeah, I, I, I haven't actually become... Um, a friend as such. I, I, I remain a tender. I, I think there are kind of lots of kind of reasons for that. I, I think now I have more time, I can commit myself to more, more friendly committees and things like that. But I, um, I, I felt I couldn't sort of be heavily involved in, in a lot of the kind of structural kind of things. And, and, I, and I felt my 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 strengths really are not in that that area, um, so I, I I have remained uh, an attender. Can I ask about Waterford in the eighties and how you feel the meeting has changed over the years? Mm. The Waterford in the eighties um, school is still very much a part of the meeting. I think in the early eighties. You know, there were more kind of members of staff on the uh, in the, in the meeting, I th- think, or you know, you had a couple of old headmasters, 
and um, old teachers and what have you. In 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 that sense, it was um, uh, it was still heavily well. I think birthrights had sort of been heavily part of the meeting. Um, and I, I, I think that has changed quite a bit, um, as has sort of Quaker involvement in the school to some extent. And are you conscious of the meeting playing uh, an active role in the community? Do you, do you find the meeting house is visible to those who still may be seeking? I, I, I think a lot of people come through to meeting through the school and, and particularly um, with, with the junior school going kind of a mainstream primary, like a Quaker mainstream primary school, um, you know, you, you would get um, spin-offs of parents sort of wanting to be more um, uh, curious about the whole thing. Um, but you, you do get people who um, have attended or are attending, you know. Yes, I, I, I still feel a lot of people just don't know the the presence of uh, Quakers, although the, historically there is quite a profile um, in the town and that has become, um, you know, more out there um, through blue plaques and, you know, there's a, a Quaker walk and Quaker businesses and, um, you know, her, her heritage weeks and um, what have you. I, I, I think there's there's a kind of a folk understanding, you know, that the Quakers were around and um, contributed a lot. There is still that. But do you think we should be shouting more about who we are and what we do today? In, in, in what form? I, I, I don't know. I always felt that Quakers for me uh, uh, allowed you, you to come along and um, work with whatever you found in the wider community. I, I, I wasn't involved in, um, in the school. I, I, I worked in education outside in Roman Catholic, you know, which I find very interesting. And um, I felt that um, my, my difference was, um, was kind of respected and sort of um, valued. And, and, and in that sense, uh, teaching generally, you know, what I got from meeting on a Sunday, you know, the, the, the meeting did actually um, feed into your, your, your weekly life. And, and, and I think that's the way it, it does kind of work, you know, whether Quakers are in business or Quakers are at a Quaker institution or we're working in hospitals or um, wherever, you know, I, I think that aspect is, it, 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 it feeds itself, it spreads itself in that way. You know, activism has become very fa fashionable. And um, I, I know in the 80s, um, one or two um, of, of the Quakers in meeting were concerned about um, uh, nuclear energy, and um, sort of peace issues um, that had a more public profile um, and uh, promoted such. Um, but, but, but I think those kinds of things are, are already in the community, whether you're looking at sort of the, you, you know, I, I, I wasn't in, say, trying to get cycleways because I was a Quaker, you know, do you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, I, I, I was there because I felt cycleways were, um, were important priority for, for the town, you know, and um, those kinds of things. And, you know, I, I think that there is a danger of sort of vanity projects that would have a Quaker label. That, that, that's, that's how I see it. You touched on it there. Um, in terms of Quakerism impacting on your day to day life, is that quite prominent for you outside of a meeting for worship setting? Well, I, th I think uh, aspects of things do um, 
in, in, inform you, you know, I, I was thinking of this in the, the testimonies. I think the testimonies come into focus in different times of your life or, or, or different circumstances as you find them. And, you, you know, I, 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 I say in, um, in teaching where I was working with, 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 at times, kids with challenging behavior and what have you, um, there I, I was sort of very conscious of the fact that understanding the learning styles of kids and um, how behaviors manifested themselves and how you work with those behaviors was all part of um, being attentive to the particular and developing a, a sort of a gentler way of working with um, problematic um, situations and um, individuals. Um, and I think, um, you know, finding a, a peaceful center in oneself is very important. Um, and, 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 and I think that can um, feed your, your working life, you know, um, not that, that it, it can become difficult at times and you're compromised at times and all that. Do you ever think your life would have been very different had you not found Quakers in Waterford when you arrived? I think so, yes, yes. I, I think it, it I, I think for my, my kind of personality and temperament, um, I don't find it particularly easy to sit still. I'm, I'm quite a visual person. I'm quite an active person. Um, and um, uh, I think the practice of that is um, in, in important. You know, I, say if I go uh, to mass on a Sunday and what have you, um, I can be very absorbed in the distraction of sounds and smells and the visuals and the people around me and the rituals and, and, and all that. And I, you know, for, for me, the practice of it is, 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 is good for me in, 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 in that, that I'm working with a part of myself, which is quite um, not my natural way. Do you find or have you thought about the impact of the pandemic and whether you feel it's shown Quakers in a new, in a new light or possibly the relevance or the importance of, of Quakerism at large? I, I, I think the pandemic has forced um, simplicity on people, um, forced people to live in their locality more, to um, find themselves as a source of entertainment and those around them. And, um, you, you know, for some that it's been inflicted on them. Um, uh, and, and for others, I think that, um, you know, I think it's become as a revelation, you know, that they can do that. Um, and, and I think in that sense, it, it, it's been quite a, a valuable discipline, which in, in, in some respects would be, could be seen as a quakely aspiration. Yeah, I, I think the, the COVID has thrown up things, you know, the, the importance of Zoom meetings, and you know, physical presence. You know, is physical and present presence important? Um, and well, 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 for me, the whole area of membership. When I say membership, people who who don't necessarily come along to meeting and yet call themselves Quaker. I I, I wonder whether there that there needs to be more serious um, concern about people's affiliation. You know, and, and and what exactly is a is, is a meeting, and and how uh, central should a meeting be to calling yourself a Quaker? Do you think that's? I'm guessing that's not a um, an issue that's just relevant for friends in Waterford. I presume that's a a nationwide thing. Do you think? It it it, it struck me when helping to. Um, 
compile a list of names and addresses for the, the new Quaker book, books of uh, names and addresses, um, members and attenders and what have you. And people being very happy that they were being contacted and generally wanted to stay, but wouldn't necessarily have attended meeting on a regular basis or not at all, but they still wanted that, that affiliation um, and uh, that association, where, whether it was because of sort of a family loyalty uh, going back <laughs> centuries or they used to come along to meeting, but not so frequently now, all this kind of stuff. Those kinds of things rather intrigue me. You know what? what you know what exactly is the motivation, and, and what is the nature of their? You know what, what exactly is the commitment? You know, is is there is is being a Quaker a practice and 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 an ongoing process? You know, which filters through um, meeting for worship into meeting for worship for business to a courtly meeting. And into into yearly meeting, all this kind of thing, and it's a sort of a and 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 yet also in your sort of, I think I think the, the the ordinary and the extraordinary are together, you know. Before we finish, I must ask. Uh, you you were saying earlier that you've been involved since the eighties. I'm just wondering. Are there any sort of changes that strike you that have happened over the years within the yearly meeting that sort of stand out to you? life has become more complicated for meetings in 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 the sense of okay they're you know charity commission um uh there's lots of bureaucratic stuff being put on um a smaller number of people and um i, I think waterford meeting has sort of experimented to some extent on a, a, an organization that is more bearable for people. And I think probably some things are lost on the way because of that, but other things are gained. Now, I don't know how, how in other meetings are finding that and whether they find those same pressures. I, I don't know. I'm conscious too that there is only the one meeting in the city. And there was one Tremor before it closed down. I was just going to say, do you think when Tremor meeting closed down, that left a huge void? Well, certainly what uh, Tremor, me, Tremor as a town has grown since, since the 2000s. Yeah, I don't think it's been discussed in terms of um, uh, expanding, you know, reforming the meeting. You see, Limerick meeting was to some extent respawned from from Waterford meeting back in the late 80s, early 90s, Kilkenny meeting. Um, there isn't a meeting in Kilkenny, yeah. um, although we do meet once a month uh, at a farm just outside yeah. Kilkenny yeah, yeah, yeah. because of their uh, pocket there. So to some extent that that can be a bit sapping at times for for the the meeting. So can I just double check that in terms of my history uh, timeline, um, you arrived in the 80s. So had they already moved up to Newtown from Garter Lane? Yeah, yes, they had. Yeah. When did Garter yes. Lane, when did Garter Lane close as a meeting house? Was that in the 70s? I think it was, I think it was around about 1974, 75. 75, OK. W with it being in the Garter Lane Arts Centre, it became the Garter Lane Arts Centre. Um, and uh, I think it used to be a, co a courthouse as well at times. I, I, I'm just trying to think of people within the meeting who um, very few would have businesses now. Are you conscious of many attenders in order for meeting at the moment? Is that is that a thing? Like I, in terms of the kind of ratio between members and attenders, is it sort of top heavy at the yeah. moment, or do you know? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think on a Sunday um, there are quite a few attenders. You know, know. And, 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 and people who are curious, you know, maybe at the moment it's just a seasonal thing, but I, it, it, um, it can seem that way. Have you found there's been much of a difference? I know it might be hard just as, as, a, as, a, 
as a, as a meeting. Um, do you think have have you noticed much change since Newtown went into the into the new sphere? Not not hugely. You know, there was always junior meeting, and you always had a a, a reasonable band of a dozen to twenty coming in a, on a, a, a Sunday and the leavers always got their, their books and, uh, you know, the meeting's been fairly faithful where that's concerned. The, the meeting does collect and um, uh, assemblies, um, you know, once a month or, or you know, uh, uh, a couple of times a month, you know. Um, so in that sense, the meeting still um, is there. Um, and, and of course, there is the new arrangement of a, a Quaker appointee who is going to work in the school. I think his name is Neville. Anyway, um, he's worked in the North and I think he's done quite a bit of community work and what have you. Um, I think his brief is to to also liaise with the meeting, that kind of um, thing. Almost like a link person? So, Almost like a link person, a link, is it? A, a, a link person, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah a, a sort of a Quaker pre presence in terms of personalities and what have you, you know. It, it, it might be useful for the organisation, the school and the meeting. A difficult role, I, I, I would say, but um, a, a, an adventurous one. Our next guest is Zachary Dutton, who's a member of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting in the USA. I first met Zach when he was a leader on the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage in 2010, and that was something I was eager to ask him about, his reflections and thoughts about the experience over a decade since we last saw each other. I remember falling in love with the West Coast and promising myself that I would end up out there. I also remember... Um, so maybe I'm making my way. I'm considering moving to Cincinnati. So if I move to Cincinnati, then I'm at least closer to the West Coast of the US. Um, then there's also the, I remember when it was all over and we spent like a month together traveling between Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington. I remember being like having to grieve a little bit. Like I felt so forlorn for a couple of weeks. Like I built such tight knit relationships with each of you and with the other co-leaders. And we had, we spent like every waking moment and every hour of the evening, sleeping, eating, being together. Um, it was a really powerfully close knit experience. Um, that I remember like being sad to lose. Um, it was also between like my, I graduated from college in the US and then I was gonna go to grad school. Um, and at the time I was convinced that I was gonna become a religion professor. So it was also like, really important to um, ground myself in spiritual community before going off to divinity school at the time. I remember that too. And I also remember being super proud of all of you guys when you challenged some of the more evangelical Quakers on some of their stances, like on gays um, and gay marriage and queer community. Um, and I was just like holding space for you to push at these leaders um, who were saying things that I think really didn't make sense to a lot of us. Um, so those are some of the things I remember. So had you been fairly active within the Quaker community up to that point? Yeah, I was active probably f around age 15 or 16 and on. And by that time I was like 22. Um, and had spent a lot of time working both at the Philadelphia yearly meeting in, in like volunteer volunteering um, as well as the Quaker community on campus at Haverford College, which is like a Quaker, a college with Quaker history and um, 
that likes to think of itself as embracing a lot of Quaker values and decision making uh, processes and community norms into the present day. So it was it was easy for me to stay active as a Quaker when I was in college. So I wanted to find something to continue doing that with Quaker Youth Pilgrimage. Yeah, and then, you know, I went to divinity school and while I decided not to become a religion professor, I ended up doing some part-time organizing for the uh, quarterly meeting um, or one of the quarterly meetings, which are uh, area meetings, I think, um, in other parts of the world. Um, I ended up getting the job that I have now as sort of, um, the title is Associate Secretary for Program and Religious Life for Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, which basically just means um, program director or like um, overseeing the all of the program aspects that the yearly meeting gets itself into. <laughs> Can you, years. can you tell me more about the early meeting? Is there an active group of young friends at the moment? Uh, has there been up to now? Um, what sort of structures are in place? Yeah, at Philadelphia Early Meeting has uh, an active youth program that encompasses children and families um, all the way through people um, who are 18 and then there's also a young adult program, which covers people 18 to 35. Um, the program itself has sort of evolved over the years. I think in the, in the last five years or so, there's been a real emphasis on finding ways to support children and families and young people and young adults in their local contexts. Um, and so while there are still like retreats and gatherings that happen at the yearly meeting level, there's also a lot of work that's been going in to networking and relationship building at a local level um, on operating under sort of like a theory of change. That is, if we can relationship, build relationships at a local level, we can then connect people across localities and help them realize how important those connections are and cultivate some sense of meaning and purpose in that um, because we were not noticing that the numbers of people engaged level was, was dropping and that a lot of folks were sort of sticking to their home meeting and sort of operating under the assumption that they don't really need to look outside of their bubble, their local bubble. Um, but there's something important about our Quaker tradition and practice that says that we need each other and we need to stay connected across geography um, in some sort of way. So we've been trying to facilitate what that could actually mean and how we could stay relevant within a world that's so fast paced these days. And it's also a case of trying to make the meeting more inclusive as well. Yeah, there's a sense that meetings really do struggle um, with engaging people under the age of 50 at this point. I mean, it's not even really just young people and young adults, it's folks who are also young parents. So it really does feel like young people, people of color and also LGBTQ people still kind of are on the margins and often have to work hard to stay engaged because the mainstream centers kind of like white heteronormative middle, upper middle class culture. Is that frustrating? You know, it is. To, I mean, it, it is frustrating to me. Um, it's also more than frustrating. It's sort of like, I don't know what you would say, demoralizing or disillusioning. 
I mean, I think when I first started actually working as staff for the yearly meeting, I had a lot of hope that we could do a lot of, we could do good work facilitating organizational and community change. And the pushback, um, it was just really way more than I had ever anticipated it would be. Um, so we've been able to do a lot of good things, especially recently, but it has taken, you know, seven or eight years to get to a point at which we can say the words white supremacy, for example, and not have 3000 tons of defensiveness come up. Um, and we can put programs in place that center people of color and queer people and not be accused of polarizing the community. Um, like making affinity group spaces, that sort of thing. Um, and I think I've been also just thinking about hope and what hope means for me, because I realized, I've realized recently that like, you know, I'm a white cisgender queer man. And so I benefit from certain kinds of privilege. And I also experience being on the margins as a queer person. And even within that complexity, it's hard for me sometimes to find the kind of spiritual community that I really crave because of how in Quaker spaces, like heteronormative values really do get centered. So I have to do, I find myself having to do like lots of double duty, working hard to find queer community and Quaker community and that doing extra work to sort of conflate those sometimes so that I can have all of my spiritual relationships that I need to feel whole. And the reason why I continue to show up in Quakerism, I think, is because I have hope that one day, maybe for myself or for those who come after me, um, I and we won't be, won't be having to do so much work. We won't have to do double duty that we can feel more naturally like we belong. And I really have to main that, that kind of hope is like a practice. It's something I have to conjure and maintain. And I was thinking recently, like the yearly meeting is thinking and several other organizations too are thinking of changing how we work with membership to be more inclusive at the monthly meeting level and the yearly meeting level. And I, the feedback I get sometimes is that if we change that, then X and Y bad thing will happen. And I guess I just, for, for those who feel scared that something bad could transpire if we shift how we think about membership my response is like, hey, like I've had to do a lot of labor and I would hope that um, and invite us all into that practice of, of keeping hope alive. Um, because I think the, the reciprocity there is needed. Like um, we don't know for sure whether something quote unquote bad would happen if we changed how we work with membership in our communities. What we do know is that something bad is happening right now, which is that people are being excluded. So could we hope for something good to happen? Could we choose hope instead of assuming the worst? Just in terms of uh, interfaith work um, and the faith community in Philadelphia, is it quite broad? Is it quite a, a, a melting pot in that area? Oh yeah, and Philadelphia the meeting is a member of uh, several different like associations of churches um, in the Philly area and also in the U.S. So there is a council of religious leaders that's in that's based in Philadelphia um, that um, brings together people from all different faiths from Jewish. Muslim, all the Abrahamic faiths, we all, but there are, I think there are also like Buddhists and others, other religions represented in that council. And that's kind of like the interfaith council. And then there's um, a more Christocentric council that's just um, the religious leaders from all of the churches in the area that's also Philly based. 
then there's also the Council of Churches in Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania. And then we're also members of the National Association of Christian Churches called the National Council of Churches. Um, so there's lots of work happening. And I think the National Council of Churches is doing a lot of intentional work on anti-racism. And I know that PYM, that the, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting has been taking a leadership role in that, on that national level in terms of how we address racism in our communities and beyond. Just in terms of the interfaith work, um, do you mm -hmm. think do you think there's much that Quakers can learn from other faiths in terms of trying to make a positive change in the world? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. The I know there's there's a phenomenon of I'd be interested in explore and like encouraging Quakers to explore the non -denomina the non denominational Christians um, who've sort of dropped the definition of membership altogether. So that's just kind of um, one strand. There's also, um, I think there's always going to be connections, the like even to, I mean, I think we think of Quakerism and Catholic Catholicism as being quite different, but actually the, the Catholic emphasis on good works, um, I think is really similar to the Quaker idea of um, like meeting your, letting your life speak and meeting your uh, values with your actions. Um, and, you know, I think there's lots of modern liberal Quakers who use Buddhist um, practices of mindfulness and sort of incorporate those in worship settings. Um, and I, you know, I've been thinking about like the usefulness of organized religion and the importance of the church or of, you know, religion. And there's a lot of when, I think when the church is operating at its best, it is bringing people together, um, giving people a sense of how they can access meaning and purpose in life and make meaning out of struggle and joy together and um, helping to convene spaces in which other kinds of institutions can figure out, out you know, without um, regard to anyone's particular political or material interest, how to best serve society and community. Um, and, there are so many organizations that do that on a regular basis. Um, and I think Quakers, we often, I don't know, navel gaze or think that we have all the answers. Um, and I think that's one thing we need to release. Um, when it comes to any kind of change we wanna see, we need to be willing to work with whomever in that and not just with each other. For example, you know, one project that we've been engaging with that we've just been started th that we've just started thinking about at Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, we've just started thinking about uh, reaching out to other faith based organizations that center uh, LGBTQ people in some kind of way, like either serve homeless queer youth or are just like a LGBTQ affirming church space. Um, and that's the kind of thing where I think that our particular branch of Quakerism probably is more in alignment with, say, like the Catholic church down the street called, um, it may not be Catholic, it may be Presbyterian, but there's a church down the street called St. Mark's from my home meeting, Central Philadelphia monthly meeting. And it's like notorious for being like the queer affirming church in the city and they are more closely aligned probably in terms of values and our approach to how to be in the world than the quake than the actual Quakers across the ocean or continent um, who still struggle with uh, LGBT, like being LGBTQ affirming.
And that's sort of a question that I had, like um, we are associated with so many, um, with so many other Quakers um, and through those associations, either like tacitly or implicitly or actually explicitly end up condoning like violent anti-gay rhetoric um, and sort of like, what's the impact there? And I know we want to sort of be, stay in relationship with people even when we disagree, but we've also been waiting on our quote unquote Quaker siblings for like a generation um, to get over this hang up. Um, and it seems like we could actually be much, do so much more power, be so much more powerful if we engaged with other faith traditions that were more in alignment in terms of our spiritual and historical commitments. So that's just one thing I've been thinking about. And just on that, how much or how big of a role can young friends play in that or should play in that, do you think? Oh yeah, I think that there's a huge role that they can and have played. I mean, I think about in PYM, it's been 15 years that the young adults have been saying the same things kind of over and over again about how we need to revise our membership practices. And it was the young adults and the young friends who pushed not only on the issue of LGBTQ rights and gay marriage, but also on anti-racism. And I think now in my own yearly meeting, um, the work of addressing racism is at the top of mind as well as climate change in terms of the two things that are reaching kind of like a mission critical focus and it's been it's been the young adult friends and the young friends who have most powerfully advocated for us to take the steps to do things like consider whether reparations are something we need to think, consider a, can, to consider seriously, or restructuring our governance to revise how we treat membership, or um, finding new ways to support um, and be in relationship with people in our community who are on the margins. Um, so I think that they play a really critical role. But it's also clear to me that if Quakerism as the as institution at the institutional level doesn't concede to the voices of young adults and young people soon um because you know the same sorts of things have been being said for like the last 15 years we're gonna lose them I mean there's only so much hope and patience that you can cultivate before you just decide to go join the Unitarian Universalists, you know. Can I ask about your relationship with activism and what you get out of it? And also, what do you think is needed to be a powerful or a an effective activist? When I think about that, I think about the, there's a framework called the four roles of social change that I learned from this organization that's based in Philly called Training for Change. Um, and I'm probably going to get the categories wrong, but basically they talk about how in order to successfully facilitate social change, there are like different kinds of change agents that you need working at the same time. You need like rebels, people who are constantly pointing out what's wrong and you know, showing up at protests and kind of being the, the vanguard. And then you need organizers, people who um, build relationships and coalitions to push institutions and use the energy of the rebels. And then you need advocates or reformers who can take the what the organizers have organized and channel that into actual institutional reform and so when i think about activism i think how i want to think about how i place myself 
within that spectrum. There's also first responders who are um, dealing, helping to mitigate harm and dealing with the impact of harm. Um, and I think I have spent my life imagining myself as an advocate or as a reformer, sort of the person taking the energy of the rebels and the organizers and trying to channel it into institutional reform. And I still think that that is where I am called, like the work that I think I'm getting, that, that sort of being led into is anti-racism at the organizational level. And yet I also really have started to more and more identify myself with the first responder identity as well, the heal as a healer, basically, um, because I think that there's so much work as a white person that I've noticed I've had to do in terms of the work of cultivating, cultivating an anti-racist, a white anti-racist identity that has been about dealing with my own trauma and the grief work that accompanies that in terms of releasing all these things about who I am and who I think I should be and what kinds of relationships I choose and have to let go of and aspirations and all of these things that really requires grief. Um, and also just the grief of realizing how much I and my ancestors have participated in perpetuating white supremacy. And I think, wow, like it's possible that those two things are deeply connected, that the work of facilitating organizational change, especially in terms of coaching white people into that work also requires helping facilitate some their coming to terms with how much pain they've caused or, or helped to perpetuate. So when I think about activism, I think this combination of healer and organizational change agent is real for me. And your relationship with meeting for worship, what do you get out of that silent space? Are, are, are you are you going to a meeting for worship totally centered? Are you um, in, in pre-pandemic times, would you be sitting at the same seat? Would you be reading a book? Would you be knitting? Would you be, um, would you have certain techniques that you'd use to center mm -hmm. down? Um, yeah, I'm curious about your, your approach to, to meeting for worship? I think I, I definitely combine, use some mindfulness techniques um, to center myself and to prepare. I think I've got a spiritual practice of connecting with my ancestors and I, I feel a strong connection to my ancestors, um, those who came before me, both in terms of the healing work that I need to do on their behalf. And also I have a tarot practice where I, I have a little altar and I've got tarot cards and I'll, so to prepare for worship throughout the week, I'll have moments of, of I think essentially prayer where, where I'll like light some sage and pull a few cards and reflect on the message I'm receiving from my ancestors through the cards. Um, and I also have like a pre-bed meditation practice. I think those are all important aspects to the preparation of worship. And then when I go into the worship, it's um, very bodily for me. Like I situate my feet on the ground. I feel the bench or the chair or whatever I'm sitting on underneath me draw in the stabilizing, the powerfully stabilizing energy of the earth into my soul and then just tracking my breathing and my breathing helps me stay connected into that unitary sense of connection and then sometimes I'll get a message that that comes as like a passing but I try and employ mindfulness where I'm monitoring my thoughts accepting them as they come and go but not necessarily engaging them and is it hard to ignore whenever it might come along is it hard to ignore the urge to minister have you ever had that experience of 
you know, I just I really need to I really need to share this message now. I, and you're just you're, you're thrust onto your feet. Yeah, it's yes, I have. I think that's when when a thought keeps coming back around and it doesn't seem like it'll come. I'll let it I'll watch it go by, let it go. But then it just comes back and it comes back. And it, there's something I don't know, mystical in that experience leading me to share a thing. Um, generally speaking, I'm so deeply thankful. It's, there's no necessarily words to use to describe that experience other than to say that it's like coming forth from this place that my body has access to. It's almost like otherworldly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, then just asking about your meeting, uh, would you say that it would be quite an old meeting in terms of uh, attenders and members? Um, I guess I'm asking really um, aging meetings in general and how do we kind of safeguard the future of these meeting houses and these these monthly meetings uh, where, you know, uh, you might find that not necessarily there would be a strong young friend's presence at a, at a given meeting every week. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's part of a bigger picture, I know, but how do we foster that sort of that environment where young friends are encouraged to go and attend um, attend meeting? You know, it's so funny to me because I think we could, we, if I notice a, a, like one, I'm going to be reductive for a minute and like try and say there's one big difference between millennials and Gen Z's and older generations like the Gen X and baby boomers or whatever names you want to give them. I think the older generations, like they really did get a lot of meaning and purpose and community and relationship through business, like doing the work of the meeting, being on committees and going to business meeting. And those like, those things are really conflated for them. Like all of that, is the most important thing I think for older friends I notice in meeting houses and in my own meeting as well is like you need to become a member and then join a committee and I just like it's just not how my generation and how Gen Z's operate like they're the world to me and I think to us again if I'm generalizing and being reductive is like so complex there is so much work that we have to do on a regular basis. Concepts like weekends, for example, are increasingly irrelevant. Um, we often have to have more than one side hustle in order to like make ends meet or achieve the things we're trying to be up to. Um, there's just like very little sense of, of, their, of things n- not containing some amount of work all of the time. So when we, when we get to be in a spiritual space, I think we like, we want to just have the worship. We want like the worship and the community and the spiritual formation is what's most important. And if we have to do business, it should be, it generally is because that like, we absolutely need to figure X and Y, Z thing out so that we can have the relationship, the space for relationship or the space for worship. We, And I think that that's like a, big difference. And I think the way that meetings, one thing that meetings should all try is de-emphasizing committee work and business and saying like, actually, let's just have parties. Let's have knitting groups. Let's, I don't know, go to the movies together, worship as often as we can, like, read the Bible together, other sacred texts, write poet, poems together, like exercise together. Um, there's like an array of things that we can do as a community to support spiritual formation that has nothing to do with communities. And I think we need to try, we need to try that if we wanna be more inclusive, that's one thing. So it's part of a bigger question really about the future of the structures of our organization. And as you say, is it a, 
is it almost like a, an historical thing that these older generations are holding on to? And is there is there are there ways where we can be more efficient with doing our business and reaching yes. out and, and in terms of engagement and reaching out to, as you say, the the baby boomers or the generation X's or whatever you call them? Because um, I I guess it's possibly more pronounced in smaller countries. Mm -hmm. Like there's proper, you know, I think the, maybe one of the feedbacks to that is like, well, there's property that needs to be managed and there's meeting finances that are not gonna, um, you know, like sheet themselves. There's, um, there's going to always be work that needs to get done. Um, but how can we make that work happen efficiently? And I mean, I'm, I don't want to prioritize efficiency. I think efficiency can often be used as like a tool to perpetuate um, certain kinds of oppression to just say like, oh, we need to get through this as quickly as possible. So we're not going to hear, make space to hear concerns of folks on the margins. Um, but I think that, that there's ways in which certain kinds of decisions can be given different types of weightiness. Um, so you might like, I don't know, hire a bookkeeper to do the finances rather than have a committee do them. And would that really be non unquakerly? Um, the, it's sort of that type of thing that I think, do we really need to be spending any time at business meeting thinking about things like what, like what color to paint the walls or whether to like um, repair the oven or just replace it in the kitchen. Those types of decisions I think don't need as much time and attention as I think we sometimes think we need to give them because what we should be doing when we're together in business meeting is thinking about like how we want to show up with each other in community and what our values are and how we're deeply rooted in a vision for our faith for the long haul and those kinds of things. Do you have a sense of, do you have a sense of, of growing out of, of the young friends community where that's the, the end of something and making that transition through age to something that is, that's different or new or uncertain? Yeah, I think, well, it's interesting because I remember when the, when we were on the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage, I would hear some of the young folks who are from, uh, who were not from the U.S. talking about sort of the way that religion gets treated in other countries is a little bit different and that there was sometimes more hesitancy, um, for example, for people from the U.K. to like, talk out loud about the fact that they have any kind of religion, let alone are a Quaker. Um, in the US, like, especially Christianity is just like much more culturally interwoven. Um, and in that way, there's maybe some more bridging that happens. So it's once you sort of leave your young, the little bubble of your young friend's high school experience, you've got some kind of cultural markers that you can still lean on that might be different in other countries. I definitely did feel like the reason why I'm a Quaker and the reason why I, even though I was raised in a Quaker family, didn't just rebel as I think like as a teenager, I was inclined to not wanna do anything that my parents wanted me to do. Um, so if they were Quaker, then I was not going to be. But then when I went to Quaker high, like a, a, a Quaker high school and met, it, you know, became close friends with others who were my age, who were really active in the Quaker youth group at the time that my yearly meeting had, I found a type of closeness and spiritual intimacy and connection that was profoundly like healing, I think, and affirming, especially as like a queer person where that, where that type of acceptance 
was hard to find in main in the mainstream. And I think that's the thing that I missed the most once I graduated from high school and had to do a lot of work to recreate in college. And I tried to do it with Quakers in like the other Quaker students in college, but ended up finding it more with other queer students. And that goes back to like the weirdness about how often in, even in Quaker spaces, like straightness gets becomes part of the mainstream. And that was like less appealing to me. Um, so um, the sense of like loneliness and isolation and lack of spiritual intimacy was I think the thing that affected me the most and that I had to do a lot of work to like really curate my relationships and find people who wanted to be tender and honest and authentic and have integrity and walk in this world with a sense of integrity. And I think it's only been until very recently that I feel like I've surrounded myself mostly with all people who are like that. And some of them are Quaker and some of them are not. And I think it goes also back to like, it's not just having peers who are like that, but also elders. Like I have lots of mentors in my life as well, who I go to for advice and processing and, um, I rely on elders and I think that that's an aspect of Quaker faith that we need. We all need to have like our spiritual teachers. Some of those spiritual teachers though are not Quaker. Some of them are, and even the ones who are Quaker, most of them are not members of my meeting, which I think goes back to another aspect of how young folks are changing the Quaker landscape. I think as society changes, just like, emphasis on a single place or a single location for community is becoming less and less. Do you think there's a huge difference in people who are from a Quaker background compared to those who find Quakers later in life? No, I don't think so. I think this term that gets bandied about is like birthright Quakers or some such, um, but even if you're born into a Quaker family, I think you need to have a convincement experience of some kind and perhaps multiple times in your life, like experiences of recommitting or deepening or shifting that or transformation that brings you back into or into in a different way, the Quaker faith tradition. And I think all of us need an experience like that. Um, and, and because all of us need it, there's really no distinction between whether or not you were born into it or came to it later in life. Finally for now, on my list of Quaker voices to share is Pauline Goggin, who attends Limerick Meeting. She's been involved with friends since the late 80s, and when we spoke, she had recently moved house, an experience she said was quite liberating. You know, there was, and... I had a, have a lot actually to kind of shed and um, every time I kind of give something away, send something to the charity shop and um, ask somebody if they could use something, you know, it, it's just been great that um, I've been able to do that. And there's no end of people wanting what I have. And there's a lovely second hand bookshop here in Nina and they're delighted to see me coming. I have a huge library and that has been kind of, I suppose, one of the things that I found hardest now to make decisions about. But uh, I've almost stopped buying books at this stage and I'm becoming a good library user. And that's, you know, that's making a difference as well, you know. And is it quite remote, the area that you moved to? It's not. It's, it's actually very near the centre of a, a nice, busy market town called Nina in County Tipperary. And um, so I'm literally a five minute walk away from a shop or the market or um, if I want to meet somebody for a coffee or the station is around the corner. There's very good public transport here. So it's actually a very good, convenient 
a place, you know, for me to to move to at this age of my life. And I have family nearby as well, you know, just over the border in Clare. So that that feels nice, you know, that they're not that far away in that. And yet at the same time, I can still be independent and get on with myself. Limerick is my my meeting, actually, the meeting I'm part of. But because of COVID and that, um, I've been um, on Zoom. I haven't actually been back to my physical meeting yet in Limerick. And although in Clock Jordan now, there's um, a new um, merging of Clock Jordan and Ross Gray, and they have a, a meeting once a month, I haven't yet had the opportunity to to get out there. And that's not too far away. That's just about 20 minutes drive out the road. So how far back does your involvement with friends go? It goes back to 1989 when I heard that there were Quakers in Limerick uh, I hadn't known. And um, because of a weekend activity that I had was taking place in my house, part of it was um, a quiet hour um, led by um, somebody that was was uh, participating and I turned to my neighbour and I said you know this is something I'd love to do more of on a Sunday now just to be quiet and still with others and she said oh you should try going to a Quaker meeting and I found out then and uh, Limerick were having um, a meeting for worship once a month then and uh, so I waited until the next available Sunday and went in. And I was a little bit disconcerted by the silence, but as it deepened, I actually felt kind of peace. And a, an older friend, a woman, uh, gave ministry and that was a first for me to actually hear a woman give ministry and to take that, that role in worship setting. And um, I just felt a sense of uh, rightness about being there. And um, I, somebody said to me a few years later, you know, a Quaker is find each other or that, that you know, the Quaker in you finds, <laughs> finds a meeting. So I don't know of, of that, but I certainly, I felt I was directed and always appreciated the fact that I've never looked back really. That really must be quite something to think just how much Limerick Meeting has grown over the years. Tremendously, it, because really within a quite a short period of time, I think it was 1996, we had a new meeting house in Limerick. So we went from a month, one meeting for worship a month, to fortnightly meeting, then to a weekly meeting in quite a short space of time after I joined. Don't think it was due to me now. But <laughs> and, and, and then we were talking about uh, building a meeting house and we had some funds, uh, because when Limerick Meeting was laid down in, I think, the 1950s and the building was sold to the Red Cross, uh, the Munster Quarterly Meeting of Waterford um, held those funds, you know, in, in the meeting, in their, their um, accounts. And uh, an elderly friend who came every summer to Milltown Malbe and participated in Limerick meeting. She left her house uh, for, to actually help, uh, the sale of the house helped also to build the meeting house. So there was very little, we had a little bit of fundraising to do, but very little. And the, the meeting house had ground in the old burial ground. Um, so it was pretty straightforward. We even had an architect in our meeting, Brian Grubb, who designed the meeting house. So it happened very easily. 
Do you think the community in the wider Limerick area is aware of the Meeting House and what Quakers do? I don't know that they're as aware of it as they might be. I think things, certainly with we have a Facebook page and we have had activities in the Meeting House which have helped people to to be aware of it. And certainly um, people have been very open to coming um, at different with you know in, in relation to different topics and uh, issues around peace or um faith you know diversity of faith practices and um yes we've had talks from people who have been involved in the protest at shannon airport about the use of the airport for military transport of um US troops and weapons and that. And so, um, yeah, and then there would have been um, a lovely historical um, interest as well. And the people, the wider population would have been interested in the Quaker history in Limerick and how much of, how many businesses were involved and the spread of how old <laughs> Quakers, how long we've been in Limerick really, I suppose. That would have been something that uh, was of interest to historical groups, you know. And we've we've had a couple of historians in our midst that have been very, very able and willing to to lead walking tours and talks and that, you know. And are you conscious of how being a friend, being involved with the local meeting and saying you're a Quaker how much that has influenced other aspects of your day-to-day life? I would have to say, yes, it has. I think it has probably opened up uh, possibilities for me in terms of taking a stand against um, the arms trade, for instance, and um, joining friends in their witness for peace. And uh, I think that those opportunities you know are something that I've deeply valued and um, I think also it has it has been very helpful to um, my my non-friends if you like my friends with a small s have always been interested in that aspect of my spiritual practice and with friends and um, I think also it has made me so much aware of simplicity and integrity the testimonies really you know testimony of peace and equality particularly all of those have been really wonderful for me to actually experience and to be a part of so I think that it has had an effect on, on my family life, certainly. I cert- it certainly advanced my, um, my aim, my aspiration to, to live simply so that others can simply live. And um, um, I, you know, the accumulation of things, you know, even clothing, uh, that um, has been, you know, has. I mean, I, I would have kind of worn clothes for a long, long time, and I have clothes going back for years, you know, and that that I still wear. But even at that, uh, you know, and I love to make clothes and that. But even at that, you know, when's enough enough? So I think I've become more, and especially in the times that we're living in, you know, I think it's just. It's it's harder for me as a friend to not be aware, shall we say, you know, of the need to kind of pair back. Are there many people outside of friends that would ask you about being a friend? Well, my, certainly my friends and those who know me, you know, are always interested in what I'm up to with friends. And you know, when I travel to the European and Middle Eastern section, for instance, um, they're always keen to hear how things are going in Europe. 
and I'm able to, I suppose, share something of the of the everyday experience of some friends that I would meet. Um, and um, that's been that feels like it's a sharing of of um, experience. And um, yeah, so I'd say that the people who know me and who know that I'm a friend uh, would be, you know, would well, they would know that of the things that I do, you know, <laughs> because I'd be just telling them that anyway. You touched on it there. In terms of being involved with the wider network of friends on the continent, are you conscious when you do travel just how we're viewed as a collective group of Irish friends abroad? Or do you think that there's well, something unique that sets us apart? Of course, than, um, you know, like after Britain, we would probably be the biggest yearly meeting in Europe. Um, and um, for many European friends, they're worshipping in very small groups or their individual friends trying to connect. So the annual meeting of European um, and Middle Eastern section is very important. And I think that Irish friends uh, really um, have a lot to, to offer friends and, and, and it's looked for, you know. So I think we, we usually send a number of representatives and uh, like you were there now yourself in, in uh, you know, online. Uh, we were there in, in Paris this year. Well, on, online, of course, you know. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that, 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 we're, that we have, there's more of a sense of endurance and long, a longer um, experience, sense of experience as, as, a, as, a, as a community, as a bigger community. And I suppose there's that experience of, of Quakerism too, in terms of business method and, um, and um, interests. But I think that was probably more looked looked to in the past. I think nowadays uh, the European and Middle Eastern section is really kind of carving new ground and I think through Woodbrook there has been a lot of progress in terms of online meetings and um, connectivity I think is easier now through the internet whereas um, I remember when I when I went to a Quaker meeting in Bar 2002, I think, 2003, and uh, there was a tiny meeting there uh, that had been there since Franco's time. And um, it was this more or less the same people with a couple of newcomers, we'll say, and uh, they were meeting in an apartment. And, but finding out about that meeting was much more difficult for me then than it would be now. So uh you know we were only getting used to mobile phones really back then, you know. So I think that I think that uh, I think that Irish friends are always welcomed and I think that there's a, a fine majority there's a fine group of young Irish friends or younger Irish friends that have been very lively or over the place so which is great how do you feel about outreach do you think we should be doing more of that oh well it is and it's cer certainly something that has come up in our conversations recently in meeting and uh, we've really been putting our minds to that you know in terms of how we can actually share some of those aspirations towards simplicity and um maybe just mending and uh, repair work and um, different activities that would uh, provide opportunities for conversations about um, living with the crisis, in the crisis that we're living in, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly, you know, in terms of peace work, 
you know, recently, um, um, I, myself and uh, a, a, another friend who is not Quaker, we had a, we ran a peace tent at the local uh, festival in the eco village in Sock Jordan at the beginning of the summer there, and it, it was it was um, it was good to be able to share. Uh, something of the peace testimony with people who were very, who were really struggling with um, the, particularly with the war in Ukraine, you know, and and having, you know, issues around neutrality and thinking about neutrality as being something of a kind of a, a, a them or us kind of thing rather than, um, you know, understanding. The, the ideal of, of, you know, that of God and everyone, you know, and, and, and um, that people were suffering everywhere. And how, how could we support and uphold people in the pain of war um, without necessarily having to, you know, be an enemy or um, against people, you know. That, the opportunities to share these things, I, I try and take them wherever an opportunity arises, you know, without kind of um, proselytizing or anything like that. But just if people are curious about what I'm doing, and of course, you see, I am an artist, so um I do some of the work I do is very visible in that I would make banners for the front of my garage but like this is what I did in the past you know uh, for peace and um I think there's one or two of them now in the in the, the National Museum around different issues but you know it's not it's not to to make a big noise but to just kind of, have another voice, have another idea in the community that might not necessarily be popular, but 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 isn't adversarial. So um, it's finding that balance, I think, is a challenge for us all, really. Do you think your life would be very different had you not found friends? I think so. I think so. I think so. I think there's a quality that of stillness that has really helped me in my discernment as a human being uh, in my personal life and in my public life. And um, I, I, when I, when I came to friends, I had been seeking. You know, I had I'd come from a Catholic, Roman Catholic background. I grew up and I, I always would have had a deep faith. But the structures of Catholicism, uh, I, I found, I, I probably outgrew that you know, and and was looking for something, I'm not sure what, until I found it with friends. And I think that uh, Quakerism has really supported me to live adventurously and to live as well as I can. Uh, and to kind of, and to know that every day is sacred and um, living with that idea has really helped me in all sorts of ways to be a better person i think and at the end of the day I'm sure that's that i'm very happy with that i'm not perfect yet mind you i'd, I'd like to think so I mean, when, when I think of any of those testimonies now, the testimony of simplicity, how could it not be helpful, you know, in terms of, of the dwindling resources in the world and 
the need to to share the right sharing of world resources that we were hearing about at this year's yearly meeting. I I I I couldn't see that it can't be, you know. And um certainly I think that 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 is up for review and um but I think I heard something recently, you know, in terms of peace. You know, we might never see an end to war, but we might find ways of living. We can hold the aspiration for peace, but living with war and supporting people who are suffering and, and uh, challenging structures of injustice all of those things, you know, are relevant, and 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 trying to, I suppose, be aware of the seeds of dissent and um, conflict in our own lives, in the wider society, and within our own society, our friends. These are relevant truth, speaking truth to power living a life of integrity and truth, you know, also, why would that not be a useful going forward? I can't think of why it wouldn't be. And um, community, sense of shared, you know, even the name friends, you know, the upholding of each other and, and um, of our neighbour and neighbours, you know, that that has been intrinsic to who we are as as friends, and um, long may that ever be so. And um, equality, equality, you know, not only in gender but in 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 um, resources, in uh, opportunities, um, in our our living in our lives, you know, and across diversities all of these things are so relevant and never more so than in today and i think it's wonderful that we in ireland you know that we've even kind of been able to espouse the diverse diversities that have challenged us so far and um you know hopefully that would continue and then stewardship you know the the idea of the responsibility that we have in terms of the earth and creation and you know to 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 not abuse the wonderful world that we have and to be reminded of that you know and and to do our best you know to do our best in our own lives and you know to to uphold our politicians and our our governance you know in the work that they need to do as well yeah i mean it's all there it's all there for us <laughs> to hold on to and to and to uphold and to pray for light you know going forward and uh, to to hold to hold our testimonies in the light as well as everybody else in the 30 odd years that you've been attending now are you aware of just how much the early meeting has changed i am i am i mean now we for instance we don't have our special interest groups uh, taking up an afternoon and they're held before the early meeting online and um, the i think a lot of the business is managed now um outside of the early meeting program and um so that kind of makes the early meeting, I think, a place where there's a lot more time for spiritual reflection and um, thinking ahead to what our priority is for us as friends at the moment. And um, it, was, it was great to hear of the challenge, I suppose, to think about what the peace testimony might mean to us as friends at this time that we're living in and not to take it for granted or to assume that we're all on the same page as friends with it 
And um, so I do think there has been, you know, I think that I think there's been a real effort to um, to kind of um, tighten up on the, the the program and to try and um, try and listen more to to the body of friends in terms of the kinds of of um, uh, input that might be needed, you know, from a spiritual point of view and business, and also I think in terms of our faith in action, you know, how how are we acting as friends, you know, how should we be at this time, you know, what can we do, what can we say. These things, I think, are much more heightened at the moment than they have been for a long time. And it's not to say that friends weren't active in the past, where there's a heightened sense of, of what we're being called to at the moment. I suppose I'm somebody who kind of has always looked at the glass half full and rather than half empty. And I, I have, I, I do put great faith in our uh, process um, as friends, you know, and I think that that's not going anywhere, really. I think that it's something that is sustaining us, continues to sustain us. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of change within the society, but then there's always been change within the society. And I think that we, we as, a, as a society and as a religious group, we have been open to evolution. And I like to think that that will actually support us as we go forward as friends. Um, and that's already happening, you know, in terms of now, you know, hybrid meetings uh, for worship and um, the difficulties that some friends have and other friends are, are up for it. And um, I think that we're at a moment when we are traveling through changes and um, and and we're challenged and great i say that we're not we're not we're not uh, you know comfortable or, or becoming complacent so i i i would have great faith for us as we move forward uh, I, I think we are facing uncertain future um I'm, but I I am personally I, I I do lean on my faith and um I find that my faith and faith in creation and faith in in um, the kind of listening that we're we're, we're called to is something that I do have faith in and that I, 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 I feel will support us as we go forward. Having said that, who knows if, if the, you know, who knows how we will be? It is as yet it has to be revealed, you know. When I came into friends, I was in need of healing, I have to say that, you know. And um but it, there was that sense of um under the understanding of healing as ministry that uh, was very powerful. And it's something that I've kind of stayed connected to uh, through the years with friends. And I think it was much more important to the older friends that I met in years gone by. But it's, it's lovely to see now younger people coming into the meeting for worship with the tension to healing um, that that I've noticed in the last few years, you know, and um, it was great to have um, not only a meeting for the first time ever, a meeting for healing online this year before the early meeting, as well as one in person. And that's it for another episode of The Friendly Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. If you like what you've heard, don't forget you can subscribe to our social channels. And if you'd like to find out more about Quakers in Ireland, you can find us online at quakers.ie.